Hello, everybody. So I'm very happy to be here to host a discussion on how design will improve the human experience in wearables. So I will start with my first question. So we, as the conference title states it, we are the dawn of wearable technology. And it looks like early adopters are the majority of users. So really, how do you design a product that has mass consumption appeal and is not just a technology showcase? Since I'm on the end, I guess yeah. I'll start. Um, I'm Dan, by the way. Nice to be here. Uh, you know, when I think about wearables I, and design especially, I think about how really this is not a new industry. With technology it is, but hundreds of years, no. I would dare say hundreds of thousands of years ago, we were trying to figure out how to keep ourselves warm and we were really thinking about fashion and wearable things that provided some kind of shelter, comfort, um, and ultimately adornment and decoration. And I think this is sometimes forgotten by the companies that maybe have invented an interesting technology but really haven't um, necessarily manifested in a form that people can relate to. To me, it's all about making a tight connection between that technology and whatever purpose it has, whatever kind of fundamental function it's offering to the end user, whether it's uh, enhancing productivity or increasing performance of an individual. We live in, an, uh, in our lives now where performance is everything. We want performance everywhere. But we've forgotten how to make it appealing and beautiful and generally just wonderful. And that's what we strive to do. So any other thoughts on that? OK. So how do you plan and test for a product um, that has be, to be worn by human and uh, that has uh, to conform to different users' lifestyle? And how do you address customization without increasing the cost? So I have two questions there. Uh, I'll break them up. Um, hi, my name is Gerson, by the way. Um, so testing for one of these devices is critical. Um, you know, we're, we're making uh, devices that are meant to sort of merge with our bodies. I mean, in order to, you know, the, the, we're designing products that are trying to, you know, pick up the activities that we're in every day and throughout our day, including sleep and showering and exercising and sitting around and doing our work. And so we're really trying to marry uh, the technology to our bodies. And our bodies have had a chance to evolve to the rigors <laughs> over millions of years. So um, we have a, a kind of a unique challenge there um, in that we're trying to build a device that not only uh, senses our movements, um, but is also somewhat discreet and lightweight. Uh, we don't have uh, the kind of the uh, uh, advantage of expecting our users to armor the devices and cases and things like that. I and mean, we're really trying to be uh, as uh, discreet as possible. Um, that said, with all the rigors of our lives, I mean, to plan to test for that, you have to observe uh, exactly how people are using them. And so look at how, like, what the typical uses are and observe how people do that. And you also have to try to predict how people will misuse products. Um, and I'll be fr quite frank, I mean, it's a, it's a very lengthy and expensive process to develop those tests. I mean, you have to uh, develop test fixtures and uh, design, the, design those fixtures almost as, like, as you would a product and put a huge number of products through those tests uh, so, that, so that you can get the uh, confirmation that your design is robust enough. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite an undertaking to, uh, to test for these devices. And, and I mean, as we get into you know, next generation products, it will be, get easier. But right now, we're in, kind of on the forefront. And so a lot of this is uh, very new. And we have, to, you know, we have to learn from our users. Um, and that's kind of the final step is we can create all these tests and kind of predict what's going to happen. Um, but ultimately, we have to correlate that back to what really happens. Um, so wear testing is, is critical. And we, just, we need to get more uh, products out in the market so we can see how, it, how that fares out and we can evolve that, that testing. 
Um, I guess you had a second part of your question. Yeah, customization. Because you know, uh, different users, they have different way of living. And uh, specifically, specifically, when it's come to wearable, uh, it's gender coded. So fashion is gender coded. So you have different users, and so you have to address different form factor. Uh, so how do you do that without increasing the cost? So I think, uh, so I, I completely agree. I mean, the. the uh, the devices need to merge with your activities. So, uh, what what's good for going to work and going into you know uh, an exercise may not be good for sleeping. So you do need to be able to adapt. Uh, so there is that level of customization. Um, to do it without cost, I think is um, not necessarily the goal. I think the key is to make sure that you add value with your customization. Um, you know, you're providing features that actually allow the customer to use the device in all aspects of life, rather than saying, I need to add some customization so that I can put a little extra bling or something like that, so that it, you know, I mean, granted, fashion is an important thing, but um, it, I think you need to make sure that you're adding that, that functionality so that if, if there is an additional cost, that is actually uh, something that the customer is willing to pay for, because it expands their, uh, you know, their whole experience. Any thoughts? Yeah. So, oh, go ahead. Oh, so, okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, uh, so just to add to that, um, I think uh, to complete the uh, thing with um, targeting genders, I think it's important to look at it as you develop a technology, but then you have to make sure it's adaptable to different personalities and demographics, male or female, that doesn't matter. Yeah. And just like how you can have a Nike dry fit or some clothing, which is a technological innovation, you make that happen, and then you make different versions that are for, you know, um, uh, for runners or for swimmers or, um, or for, you know, are targeted towards males or females. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and right now we're at the point where the technology is being perfected and it's, uh, it's, it's maturing to a point where now we can start thinking about how uh, we commoditize it and get it to a point where it, it appeals to every individual that is in the market for such a product. Okay, so um, from the iPhone, uh, which was the first phone with only one physical button, we know that simplicity and brilliant ergonomics drive mass adoption. Gesture and voice will be the most promising innovation that will simplify the human-machine interaction. So how do you uh, design a compelling product that uh, is providing this type of user interface? Um, so I, I'd say uh, the one physical button, it was a good step uh, you know, towards, um, towards an awesome interface. But that doesn't necessarily mean um, you know, that's, that's how things are going to evolve when we go to wearables. Right? For example, um, you may not even have a button. You don't, there's, there's intent and there's context to what needs to happen, which should take care of half the issues. So when you walk up to your, uh, walk into your living room, your TV detects that you're there, and it brings up channels that are um, personalized for you. But then with a device that um, can, you know, uh, can um, communicate your intent, such as Nord or any other uh, device, you go and say, OK, that's what I want to watch. Or you want to search for something, you type that in, and then you watch um, whatever channel you're watching. And then you walk out, and it turns off. And the next person walks in. That brings context to um, to what they're trying to do. So, so the user interface as a uh, as a single thing that you can fix uh, um, your eyes on and say, oh, this is a WYSIWYG interface, will kind of disappear and it'll become ambient. And um, and towards that, we think um, the human body needs to become an input device, whether it's gestural or voice or anything. Uh, but it needs to be with you and always on you. And so. I, want to, I just want to add something really quick. When you, when you ask the question, how to design something like that, we always ask ourselves, what, what can it do? That's more technology derived. What really can it do? What are its capabilities? As designers, we often ask ourselves, what should it do? And that comes from observation and living and being the user, truly internalizing the end user's needs, becoming the user, like, like a character actor becomes the end user, and it's coming at it from the other side. I think a lot of you in the audience are probably inventing really cool technologies and thinking, how can I offer this to the end user? First, understand the end user. Do they really want it? And then, should it be a minimal interface? Should it have one button? Yeah, it worked on the iPhone, but not really. I mean, there are 
thousands of buttons on the iPhone. It's all coming up on screen, so it's not really one button. And most products aren't. Um, I the one that one Sean's physical, working on is going to be button. one button. I said one physical button. <laughs> ah, okay. Physical. Okay, so uh, one of the major fields that will bring a lot of value to wearables is health. And so do you think that uh, health um, wearable products that address major problems like chronic pain or hypertension, they need also to be aesthetically pleasing to sell? And how do you leverage wearable technology uh, to address chronic pain? Um, hi, hi, my name is Sean. Um, our company is developing uh, digital products for pain relief. Uh, to quickly address uh, that addre uh, question, um, when we're doing our exploration with talking to different sort of healthcare, uh, you know, companies, uh, manufacturing companies, we look at um, the interaction between the doctor and the device. Whether it's the doctor or the patient, it's an emotional interaction as much as it is a you know a rational interaction. First, you know, in our case, we definitely have to solve pain. That's the first step. But going further than that, there is a placebo effect around pain. There's also a placebo effect around a diabetes sort of glucose meter reading. You know, you have a doctor that looks at this technology, for example, Agamatrix, which is a glucose meter company. They have this device, you know, it's extremely accurate compared to existing uh, glucose meters. They take the data to the doctors, they show, okay, hey, there's, you know, these sort of statistics regarding the accuracy of this reading versus all their, you know, uh, glucose meters, show the doctors, doctors didn't care. Um, next thing they do, they make an iPhone app, connect it to the glucose meter, there's a four second sort of GIF in the front of that, that app that shows when you put in the, the blood sample this animation. You know, it's, it's showing the, the analysis happening. It's kind of this just an animation. And until they did that, they didn't notice the doctors actually kind of adopting the treatment. You know, when they did that, they saw, oh my God, the doctors are like, okay, wow, this, this really is more effective. It had nothing to do with um, the actual technology. It was how they presented the technology. And so even if you're a surgeon, you're sitting there and you're, you're working with surgical tools, you have an emotional attachment to those tools. And so, um, even in cases like where, oh, surgical surgeons d d don't care about these things, but they absolutely care about these things because they build a connection to those tools. And so if you can design it to fit the person, it's not about aesthetics, but fitting, you know, messaging to that person, this is for you, uh, I think that's sort of a, it really does help the healthcare outcome as well. Um, because pain is, is in your head, you know, and so placebo effect doesn't That's interesting. That. What you just said is that the healthcare and consumer electronic and entertainment, they might all somehow be related. I think that's, I think that's true. It's appeal to the emotional side, get the technology right, create a compelling form factor, create a winning product. I can give a presentation and do it here. How, here's my company. This is what we're doing, A, B, and C. Or I can say, hey, look at this out. Check this out and give a story. And so it's the same product. It's just how you, how you tell it. And, and colors affect that. You know, textures affect that, but it's not just, oh, what color is it, what texture is it? It's, does that feel like I want it to feel? And if it does, then, then it kind of clicks, and then you kind of believe even the rest of the story that's, that's there. Um, so, yeah. yeah so, um, I would like to go further on this question. So, uh, as a designer, you had to design a lot of medical devices. So, how, how do you balance the, you know, the technology side of it and the aesthetics because we have seen like uh, emerging company like uh, I help for we things they actually uh, come up with uh, beautifully designed medical devices that before was like very ugly like hypertension uh, you know uh, devices so what do you think about that Dan? I just think everything should be designed well <laughs> yes. um, so, the short answer you know it was if you think, like especially with healthcare, you know, probably the best example of a wearable is a Band-Aid, right? That was invented how many, who knows how long ago a Band-Aid was invented? I'm, 50 years ago? I don't, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. It moves with you. It's easy to put on. But it's not so easy to take off. But, um, you know, I think as long as you really believe in kind of the fundamentals of improving an experience for the end user, whether it's healthcare product, uh, you know, that's used even in the hospital, where there's a lot of sort of tasks and operations that have to be optimized, or if it's an individual end user that's using a product like the type that you want to make, um, they, are all, they are all united in human needs. And as designers, as engineers, as technologists, we just need to reconcile with all of those and create the best configuration possible. I, I was just going to add, I, I do think that it's critical to have a visionary um, to sort of guide the way and keep the, uh, the team united. Um, I think it's really easy to design products that are very feature rich and uh, 
sorry, to, that, that's an apologize. It, designing features is not necessarily easy, but it's from a product perspective, it's it's uh, tempting to just add features to uh, to create a more uh, to reach a broader market or uh, you know make uh, your your device appeal to more uh, a bigger audience, but having having a champion to really focus the the efforts into succeeding in creating a vision is key to uh, not overreaching and really making sure that uh, we're making the correct choices along the way. I mean, we're being asked to design products extraordinarily quickly, uh, more and more. I mean, it just keeps getting faster. And um, in order to you know achieve the the vision, uh, you you don't you don't want the necessarily the technology the, the the people who are inventing the technology to be the ones to just decide like this is uh, you know this is the product. I mean, there's just so much more to it. There's the psychology, like Sean was talking about, that you know, you, you just it's unusual to have all those all that insight in one person. And so, to to bring together visionary and the technology, it, it's really critical. And I, I'd like to add that um, at the the other component to that is um, also data based on how you use it, how your initial pilots are running, and you know, if you want you want like hundred people to try it or five hundred people to try it. Uh, just because it's going to add and uh, give you so much data on how you can tweak it. Uh, for example, in our case, people fidget with the, the ring, right? And they're going to like turn it around so many times, and and we had to figure out how we kind of like ignore those events when they're doing these things. Uh, and maybe it's it's just um, certain people that do that, certain people may you know keep putting it in and out or something like that. Uh, but but um, data is a big component too because you need to. Uh, try it out as much as the um, design and the product um, ideas and the technology is there. It's um, it needs to be like tested with a group and and actually it's not just a group. It's uh, it needs to be like a live feed of what's going on. So you close the uh, feedback loop and you're like, okay, this is not working, and you iterate fast and your next version needs to be better based on what data you've learned from the prior version. One point about this that uh, Anush just mentioned. I love the idiosyncrasies about how how people interact with devices. It's not just about formulating the perfect plan on how a product is to be used. It's often the case where people are fiddling about with things. We made the Nod Labs ring, for example, the Nod, almost in the form of like a, a teacup handle where you have the opposite forces working against one another so that when you do fiddle it, you can center it at the same time, bring it back to a position where it's very easily used. And that, I think it's important to recognize that kind of hidden dimension of human need and human behavior and represent that in the design, address it. So do you think that successful consumer hardware products are made by teams that have a secret sauce uh, in making designers and engineers collaborate effectively? I think like when you look at product design, people view it as like an engineering approach or like a problem-solving sort of exercise. Um, if you look at it like an artistic, you know, approach. If you look like you know a piece of art or like a, a song, or to, to make that really beautiful and elegant, and just like t to blow it up or just make it amazing, uh, it's, it has to be a masterpiece. You can't just like do everything and then leave the mastering out of the song. No, that'll just ruin the song. So you have to like when you're looking at this whole idea of building a product, it's, it's you have the engineers, you have the designers, you have the marketers, you have everyone around, and you're trying to make a masterpiece. And so you're trying to make this orchestra uh, in, in a certain way that yeah, it does sort of seamlessly work and interact together so everyone has the information they need so that when you're kind of the guys going out and trying it on people, the engineer knows what's coming back to them and can, can iterate that and, and uh, address that. And it's not just like developing the product amazingly and then, then going to marketing. It's also like, wait, will people that, you know, play sports even wear our device? Or will people that, you know, our grandmas even buy our device? Like if I have a pain treatment device, I have a lot of different markets out there. So it's tying that in as well and saying, okay, what is the path to success exactly for the next two years? And then we'll guess about the rest. But, you know, it's like you can kind of determine that if you have a strong team that, you know, knows how to do its own parts. Agreed. But, and all great products require collaboration between people like us and you, where you've got engineers and designers and technologists all working together with a plan. The secret sauce, this, this very kind of cliched secret sauce words, that to me, the, uh, it's, it's a bit um, maybe overused, but it's, I think the secret sauce maybe comes in 
the rather unusual insight, sometimes I'll call it a hook in the design, something very special that you might add. And that often comes from an individual, an insight that someone has on the team. It's important for the rest of the team members to recognize when that hook is presenting itself and then to know how to present it in that final product. And I'd like to add um, that with all of those components in there, there's also relentless focus on the consumer or the customer because in the end, if they don't want it, like if you make something that's shoddy or it doesn't really appeal, then that's you know it's it's a failure. So, at you know um, times can get trying, but you still need to be like, okay, that's the product, and you need to focus on it. You need to give up like short-term games for the long-term uh, uh, payback, if you will, uh, and that takes some um, hard work. I'd also like to add that I think that. Uh one of the secret sauces is just passion for what you're working on. Um, I think there's nothing less in, or more infectious than passion. I mean, you work with people who are uh, just so dedicated to what they're doing that you want to be involved. And I think that, that, that type of a, you know, infection throughout an organization is uh, uh, just magical. I mean, so it is kind of the secret sauce. And having that is uh, one of the keys to success. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we have maybe one minute for a couple questions. One or two minutes. So, any questions? Someone? Enough to where you have that first sort of point of validation. For us, is, is this thing going to work? And so once we had built out the functionality where it could work, we went out and checked, you know, does it work? Yeah. Uh, and the next step was, OK, do people want to buy it you know, for this or that reason? Build something that could sell and then say, here's a price. You know, what do you want to pay for it? So it's, it's just milestones you want to hit. And first one is whatever you're telling the VC. You know, like, or, no, not that, actually, because that's a lot of bullshit. <laughs> no, no, it's, no it's, VCs it's, here. Yeah, yeah. I know. We all know. <laughs> you know I'm joking. Um, so it's, it's, it's really just that first indicator of what makes you feel that much more confident, and, and other people feel that much more confident about what you're doing. So and that's usually tied to the value, I guess. And I'd like to add, uh, especially for products that people have not seen, there's a little bit of, like, um, you know, um, education in terms of what this thing is, right? It's like uh, we've known rings for a while, and we were building a ring. Or actually, we started with something that wasn't even a ring, um, and we just knew what the problem was. And we, we've made prototypes. We incorporated last May, and since last May, every about six weeks or so, we make a hardware revision, um, and it's shrunk from something that's this big, which um, you know we didn't show off too much, but. Um, but once it got to a form factor, you know, it had some industrial design and it, and it kind of resembled what the future could hold with it. Uh, we took it to, uh, I mean, we launched and we showed it off to the public. But, um, but it comes back to whether you, as an, uh, if you put on the hat as a consumer, are going to be able to say, okay, this is something I can put on and use for my PowerPoint presentations. And that, that's like one success factor, right? Or when I'm running, I want to control my music. It, it works that way. So some of these checkpoints, you just want to see that, OK, it fits something. And then you put it out there, and then you listen to feedback, right? And, and people are going to say, oh, it's this way, that way. And you listen to it, and then you iterate even faster, right? And then by the time the next Gen 2 or Gen 3 comes, you have a product that you know, is So we, we have to go ahead just quick, quickly, because oh, are we out no, over, over say, time. And, the you know, important waiting. thing is, is it still on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the important thing is just to make sure that your product vision is retained, because sometimes when you take your prototypes to that end user and ask them what they think, they're not going to give you the answer that you want to hear, um, partly because, like Anur said, sometimes they just, they're not familiar with it. And people select things that they are comfortable with and that they know, and they don't want to be the outlier. But great products often fail when they're shown to that end user the first time in the form of a prototype. So you know, stay true to your vision. Stay super passionate. Make sure you're doing things that are going to appeal to the end user that are based on that end user's experience, and you've got a winner. Okay, thank you very much. We are over time, so we have to uh, leave to let the next people uh, on stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>